Good evening, everybody, Excellency, and most of all, fellows. Um, my name is Berit Ebert. I'm the Vice President of Programs here at the American Academy, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this lecture, The Imperial Roots of Modern Greece by Yanni Kotsonas, who is our Fall 2021 Gerhard Casper Fellow. Yanni today will do nothing less than explain to us how the Greeks actually became Greek. Um, he does so in the context of a fellowship that is extremely dear to us. Um, it honors Gerhard Kasper, who for a few people, and probably most people also even, was the former president of Stanford University. For us, he was first and foremost a longtime American Academy trustee, and twice the American Academy's uh, interim president. Um, in all the various positions that Gerhard held, he devoted his energy to academic excellence, scholarly research, and constantly emphasized the importance of the humanities. Trained as a constit uh, in constitutional law, and I have the proof here, this is his doctoral thesis, called um, Juristischer Realismus und politische Theorie im amerikanischen Rechtsdenken. Um, my free uh, um, translation is Legal Realism and Political Theory in American Legal Thought. I hope he will not kill me after that. So trained in uh, constitutional law, uh, um, he was also endless, blessed with an endless curiosity and commitment to learning. I want to make clear here that I do not mean that, uh, that constitutional lawyers are per se boring. The contrary is the case. Um, so energy, excellence, curiosity, and I should add thoughtfulness are Gerhard's character traits, but not only Gerhard's, they're also united in Janni. And thus, Janni, you're the perfect fit for this fellowship. Um, the fellowship is supported by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and we are very, very grateful for them. Tonight, uh, Yanni examines the advent of modern Greece, arguing that it arose when French, Russian, and British imperial armies arrived off the Balkan coasts in the late 1700s and early 1800s, inter uh, interacted with the Ottoman, Ottoman mainland, and told the Greeks, in effect, who they were. As most of you are familiar with the American Academy's obsessions with introductions, I shall now introduce the person who will be introducing Yanni. And this is his fellow fellow, Johann Elverskog, who held the first fellows lecture of this semester last week and set the bar extremely, extremely high. We are delighted to welcome you back, Johann. Johann is the Dadman Family Distinguished Professor, Professor of Religious Studies, and by courtesy, Professor of History at Southern Methodist University. If someone uh, were to summarize Johann in a few words, um, this someone would probably um, refer to him as the quintessence of globalization. Um, born in Sweden, he had his early childhood in the US, then he attended the University of California at Berkeley. From there, he studied Tibetan, Sanskrit, and Mongolian to understand Mongolian and Tibetan Buddhism. And then he has studied Arabic to understand Islam and the Middle East. He is the author and editor of nine books on the history of Buddhism across Asia, including The Buddha's Footprint, An Environmental History of Buddhist Asia, and Buddhism and Islam on the Silk Road, um, both published with the University Press of Pennsylvania. Um, Johan tonight will have the task to introduce Yanni, and after Yanni's lecture, he will also moderate the Q&A. And the Q&A is a double Q&A today. Um, everyone in the audience is warmly invited to ask questions and think about tough questions, but also um, our participants via Zoom. Um, everyone who is joining us via Zoom, um, please do not... Um, Talk to your computer when asking the questions. Also, do not use the Q&A functions. Uh, no, do not use the chat function, but please use the Q&A function. Type it in there, and Johan will have the task to read it out loud here. Um, Johan, many thanks for joining us. Um, the podium is yours. Thank you. Well, good evening, and thank you for that kind introduction to the introduction. Um, and thus, let me begin by welcoming you all to this evening's main event, 
which it is my honor to introduce my fellow fellow, Janne Kotsanis, who is the Gerhard Kasper Fellow here at the American Academy in Berlin. Back in the real world, he is professor of history, Russian and Slavic studies, and founding director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia at New York University. And as you all know, my role in these proceedings is to shock and awe you with a list of degrees, awards, fellowships, and publications in order to confirm the intellectual firepower of tonight's speaker. And I can readily do that. If you're really interested in those things, please Google him. I, on the other hand, will turn down the volume. Maybe this is going against the mandates of the American Academy, but I'm going to turn down the volume a little on the biographical bombastics and simply note that Professor Katsonis, and maybe, maybe this is why I was invited to give this presentation, is he's a truly cosmopolitan global citizen. He was educated in Athens, Montreal, Copenhagen, London, Moscow, and New York. He's all, he is also the author of two very important monographs on Russian history, Making Peasants Backward, Agricultural Cooperatives and the Agrarian Question in Russia, 1861 to 1914, and States of Obligation, Citizenship and Taxation in Imperial and Early Soviet Russia, which won the Wallace K. Ferguson Book Prize, the Ed Hewitt Book Prize in Political Economy, and the Davis Book Prize in Social Science. Yet, rather than dwelling in the glories of the past, what I'd like to do tonight is briefly comment on the importance of, the, of his current work on the Greek War of Independence in a global context. And then this is an event that not only presaged the eventual collapse of the Ottoman Empire, but also foreshadowed the rise of small ethno-national mo movements across Europe and the world that, of course, we're still <coughs> grappling with today. But with all of these larger issues at stake, what I want to highlight um, is Professor Kosana's decision to put religion at the center of his narrative about this pivotal event. In highlighting religion, I apologize to my fellow fellows for beginning to sound like a broken record, but I guess this is kind of my ballywick saying how important religion is. Indeed, as we all know, contrary to the secularization thesis, um, which goes back to the great Max Weber, as I was talking to somebody we had dinner about, um, contrary to the idea that religion was gonna go away, um, religion is still very much with us, for, for better or for worse. In fact, it continues to shape current events from the war on terror, to the European migrant crisis, to the religious support of authoritarian rulers from Donald Trump in the United States, to Viktor Orban in Hungary, and Narendra Modi in India. Indeed, on account of such things, it would seem as if thinking about religion would be at the forefront of the academic enterprise as we are tasked with trying to explain the world that we live in. However, as we all know, that is not the case. Rather, having been built on the edifice of modernization and developmental theory, the modern academy has deemed religion as a quaint holdover that serious people need no longer think about. And this is why Professor Kosanis' work on the Greek national independence movement through the lens of European empires and their Christianizing mission is so important. Since by taking religion seriously, he's not only overturning two centuries of nationalist historical obfuscation, but by doing so, he's also problematizing many of our basic assumptions about European empires, the nation state, and indeed modernity itself. Or in other words, he's grappling with a complicated reality that we like to call European civilization. And of course, it's lingering side effects. And as such, as with all good scholarship, his work, his work forces us to rethink everything we thought we knew. And thus it is my pleasure and honor to welcome to the podium Professor Katsanis. Thank you, Johan. Um, I mean, I asked Johan to introduce me, which is not usually how it's done, but he seemed like the most appropriate person. Uh, being at the Academy is an opportunity for all of us uh, to admire very intelligent people, uh, to make acquaintances we wouldn't have had, and to give us all the time to be creative in our very different ways. Um, and all of us should value, the, um, uh, value and be, be aware of what is the Academy has given us, and thank you all for making this happen, including my fellow fellows whom I admire very, admire very much. The, um, uh, the, the occasion for me coming to the Academy was to finish a book I've been working on. So I'm a Russian historian. Uh, which is a weakness. Uh, but when I'm doing Greek history, this is also a strength. 
because I'm not uh, seeped in the same historiography. I'm coming in from a different angle. For myself, as Johan pointed out, and very correctly, by the way, his, his summary of, 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 of my work is, um, I mean, just the, of the substance of it is not only correct, but it took away most of what I needed to say. Thank you, Johan. <laughs> and, um, um, but but what, um, uh, what I've been able to do is to approach this historiography with a different eye, and remembering that Greece is one small part of something bigger, which is Europe, which is one small part of something bigger, which is the world. Um, now, this is the 200-year anniversary of the Greek Revolution. Um, and so it's an occasion for Greeks in particular, uh, in Greece and outside of Greece, to celebrate the occasion. And all countries will do this. This is the foundational moment. This is the creation moment. This is the origin story. All countries have it. So when I speak about the Greek case, I'm speaking it as one example of what I see universally, which is nation states, which trace their origins to some particular event and some particular foundational myth, uh, which is what historians everywhere do. Uh, for the French, it might be 1789. For Germans, or for Germans, it's more complicated. 1870, 1993, <laughs> uh, you, t you tell me. But there are there is out there some floating. I mean, just yesterday, congratulations, was the anniversary. Um, it was yesterday, right? Um, yeah. Um, uh, but all countries have this. And in so doing, what they tend to do is they create um, a narrative which is interesting to the people from that country and in that country, but not really to anyone outside of the country. Um, uh, because after all, it's people patting themselves on the back. Uh, so I would ask you rhetorically, and I know what the answer would be, why would you be interested in the Greek Revolution? And so my task is not simply to say, this is how I understand the revolution itself, but to also give everyone else a reason to care. Um, the way this narrative has been structured over the past 150 years especially, but 200 ultimately, is that this was a, a rising up of a nation which has existed. Um, and most nations believe that they pre-existed, and many of them believe that they're eternal. Um, uh, the case of Greece is particularly interesting because here's a people who can claim to have existed for some 2,000 years plus. So, you know, how much more old can you get than that? How much more authentic and continuous can you, can you get than that? Add to that Christianity, which changes things but still manages to allow for this continuity, and we see 1821, the year of the revolution, the outbreak of the revolution, as this uh, liberation, an awakening, uh, and a liberation from a foreign yoke, the foreigners in this case being the Ottomans, who had only been there for 300 years. And, um, uh, uh, and that's it. It's the moment of truth and the moment of realization. What I'd like to put before you today are some aspects of what it is that I've been writing about and to propose to you um, that no nation is pre-existing and they come into existence in particular ways at particular times. They have to do with historical conjunctures. In this particular case, what we see is a nation coming into being, not just any nation, uh, but a religious group. And this religious group was the Orthodox Christians of the Balkan Peninsula. Uh, now, this becomes a nation, and that's part of the history, and the nation becomes very real. But it's on the foundations of an identity which they had inherited from Ottoman times, transformed through European influence in order to become a coherent nation. Uh, so that's number one. In other words, nations are new. They usually come into being at the moment of their liberation and the moment of uh, the struggle uh, for independence. That's number one. Number two, we tend to look at nations, as we saw with um, Peter Judson's lecture a couple of weeks ago, we tend to look at nations as a destroyer of empires. Um, and this is partly true. I mean, nations did supplant empires for the most part. I mean, there's only one empire left in the world right now, that's the United States, but it's a different kind of empire. Um, uh, the old territorial empires with overseas colonies did collapse um, in stages, uh, and the nations did take their place, for sure. But I'd like to put it to you that the empires left their legacies on all the nations. And in the example of Greece, I'm going to lay out the, the case that um, Greek nationhood drew heavily on the influence of multiple empires that entered into this region toward the end of the 18th century, culminating in 1821, to take religion and make it national. And this was new. Um, this has also not gone away. To a very large extent and in different ways, the religious identification is still part of what it is to be a Greek. Not de jour anymore, but it's certainly well understood that this is a relatively homogeneous people. I'll put it to you once more that this wasn't pre-existing. This had to be made to happen. The population had to be rendered homogeneous. And I'm going to begin by laying out for you um, who these people were who would later become Greeks. I mean, what could you have considered them before 
the creation of the Greek state, uh, which is to say culminating in the year 1830. And to give you a very brief chronology, um, this, by the way, is to give you some sense of color. Um, this is the year 1805 on what is today mainland Greece. Um, we're looking here at uh, a bishop who's seated on the left. If it looks to you Ottoman, it should, uh, because this is the Ottoman Empire, and the Greeks were Ottoman subjects, partaking in an Ottoman civilization, which had been around for a good 300 years, if not more. Bear this in mind, uh, because later on you're going to see these very same people in frock coats, transforming or changing into something else. Um, well, there we are. But I want to lay out for you um, uh, who these people were before they were recognized as a nation. And I'm going to bring you a good old usable Google map. So again, we're dealing with something which is very small um, in the global scheme of things. If you're in, you get into which, Europe. This is mostly for the most part Europe. Greece is right here, the modern state of Greece. At that point, part of the Ottoman Empire. And if you zero in even more, um, you'd have to understand that this area here, which would later become modern Greece. Can you see my cursor? Yeah. This area here was uh, multilingual and multiconfessional. Uh, this was the Ottoman Empire. Um, in terms of how the population was classified and who they were, the term Greek was not around. It wasn't an official category. There was an official category for the different religions. It was an empire, like many empires, among the, including what was described to us last week in Johann's excellent lecture. These empires and most of the world was organized not according to nationality, but according to religious ascription. Ascription, meaning you were given a designation at birth. You may convert later on in life. But your main identity, meaning the representation of who you are, has to do with your confession. And by confession, as opposed to religion, what we mean is, who do you speak to for religious, uh, for religious purposes? Uh, who do you confess to? Um, so this is more a matter of an inscription rather than what you may actually believe. So who you are in any political hierarchy or any political system depends on who you confess to, what your religion is. This area here and the core of what would become the Greek Revolution takes place here in what is today called the Peloponnese. Uh, at that time it was called the Morea. The core over here uh, was mixed. Um, it had a population which existed across the Ottoman Empire, which, as I said, was not called Greek. Uh, it was not called Yunani, which is the modern term for a Greek. Uh, they were called the Romans. The Romans. The Rum, or in Greek, the Romie. Now, why were they called Greeks Romans? Because of the heirs to the Eastern Roman Empire. When the Ottomans conquered um, in 1853, when they took Constantinople, they declared themselves to be the heirs to the Byzantine Empire, assimilating into their own rural religions, including those who had practiced Eastern Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy being the Eastern Roman Empire. So the people were called the Rum, the Romans. They themselves, for the most part, in these areas, if someone were to ask them who you are, you could get multiple answers. But in terms of like what people you belong to, they would respond, we are Romans, Romi, a term which still exists colloquially today. If they were from an area around here, this island group, and anywhere to the west, they're very likely called Greki, Greki, or Greki, uh, which is to say Greeks, but who come from the western lands, and therefore using a Latin term to describe them. These are the broad designations. Um, but if they were to ask further questions and say, well, okay, so if you're a Roman because you believe in this church, or you subscribe to this church, or you're submissive to this church, what language do you speak? Well, the language spoken really varied a lot. So as someone from this area here in what is today Laconia may have spoken a dialect which was not understood up in this area. Their movements tended to be directed not toward this central area of a landmass, but toward the sea. If you wanted to get from this peninsula here, called the Mani, and you wanted to go over here, you wouldn't use the land because there are mountains in the way, and it's difficult, and anyway, it's full of bandits. It's too dangerous. You take a boat, right? Um, and there you'd have to arrive and use all of your skills to understand what they're saying because they're speaking a different dialect of the language. Or, for that matter, um, we don't know how many exactly because nobody counted languages. They counted religions, if anything. Uh, they very likely spoke Albanian, no matter what the religion. They very likely spoke Albanian. Um, very many of them spoke Vlach, which is uh, roughly related to Romanian. 
Uh, and the only reason anyone would look at them and say all of you are Greeks is because of the same designation, which is they belong to the same Orthodox Church. But they spoke different languages. They spoke different dialects. Again, asking someone, who are you? You would ask, you say, who are you? He said, well, I'm from one of us here. Or I'm from Sparta. Well, actually, they didn't have that term. Sparta doesn't exist yet. I'm from Patra. I'm from Livadia. I'm from these places, meaning that's my primary marker. Aside from that, my more general marker is that I'm a Roman, right? meaning I'm a Christian. <laughs> now, a good part of the Ottoman Empire was Christian, and the Ottoman Empire was a regime of multi-confessionality. Theoretically speaking, after the conquest, theoretically speaking, the sultan would protect all religions of the book, meaning they all went back to, the, to Abraham, uh, this means Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. They're all people of the book, and they were organized into the separate communities, which was systems of integrating the priesthoods into governance. And so they became uh, the appointees of the sultan. Uh, they became, so the, the patriarch of Constantinople, who's the head of the Eastern Church still, was appointed by the sultan. Um, he collected taxes. Uh, he used his powers of excommunication liberally, always making sure that the flock obeyed the sultan, meaning for various theological reasons, he made the case that it was right for the Orthodox to be ruled by a Muslim sultan. And uh, in return for the submission and keeping the peace, the sultan promised peace and protection. So these were also zimis, and zimis meant, in other words, that they are people who are not Muslims, but enjoy the protection of the sultan, theoretically speaking. Notables in a region like this, but also in other regions, uh, cooperated with each other. Um, they competed with each other. Um, uh, there were notables who were Christians. There were notables who were Muslims. They spoke various languages. Um, in a region like the Balkans, the notables and the merchants tended to speak Greek as their common language, even though at home they spoke a multiple, multiplicity of languages. <clears throat> um, it was a regime, and these were members of the regime. The Christians, in other words, were also Ottoman subjects. Um, and they were also participating in the Ottoman regime. It was an extremely violent place. And before we start getting all nostalgic about empires, we should remember that the empires were themselves quite violent. They were not happy places to be. The Ottoman Empire at this point in time was a particularly unhappy place to be. Why was it an unhappy place to be? Because the, um, the system was undergoing an unintentional decentralization. It was never intended to happen this way, but this is what happened. So that the sultan and his various governors in the various places found it more and more difficult to collect taxes and to mobilize soldiers in times of war. Um, basically what happened is that conditional tenure, which existed in a whole bunch of empires actually, uh, meaning the sultan will give you some land, you'll use this land to support yourself, you'll pay taxes out of it, and you'll, um, you'll send soldiers in times of war. These were transformed from conditional estates into private estates. So that each of the different people in each of the different towns in each of the different regions, Christians and Muslims, began to look at it as their private property. And if the sultan or the bey or the pasha came and said, we need this many soldiers or we need this much money to provide for this kind of war, uh, they took it as a negotiation. They may, may, not, may, may or may not go along. So in return, the sultan begins to try waves of centralization to force them to submit, which doesn't succeed because the sultan doesn't have an army, plain and simple. He does not have an army. All he could do is hope that the notable from this region would mobilize enough forces to attack the notable from that region, and the sultan would get a little more tax revenue out of that. But there is no standing army. There's a Janissaries, but they stopped being an army a long time before. Um, so it's a matter of negotiation, competition, and increasingly violence. So if you were to read histories of Greece, because all imperial histories have now been nationalized, uh, so if you want to look back on... Um, the period of the 18th century in what is today Greece, you're going to read a real catalog, or factually true, of all the people who had been dehead, beheaded uh, by the sultan's orders or by the pasha's orders. The leader of this family beheaded. His grandchild beheaded. Um, uh, the leader of the other family, se several generations beheaded. The, the heads then became trophies, but that's, that's another matter. But there was, anyway, they were sent all around uh, to be presented in different places. Um, um, and this is all true. Uh, it, what they don't tell you is that, well, then you read the Albanian histories. Albania is right up here, part of the same region. You read histories of all the Albanians who were sent to their deaths and whose head was chopped off. If you read the Ottoman histories, you're going to read about all the Muslims whose heads were cut off. And you began to realize that it wasn't a matter of what we've been taught, Muslim against Christian. 
Greek speaker against Turkish speaker or Albanian speaker, everyone said was being cut off. The, the entire system was coming apart, in other words. And the violence was being perpetrated not by Turks against Greeks, not by Albanians against Turks and Greeks. It was being perpetrated by everybody against everybody. It was generalized. I can tell you stories. I can tell you stories. If you're to go to this area around here, uh, there's a famous figure from the mid-18th century by the name of the Vampire. The Vampire. Um, and what he was was a Greek-speaking notable who um, was attacked by another force, or an Ottoman force, and uh, he, didn't have, he didn't have weapons to defend himself, so he, um, he attacked the Turkish commander, the Ottoman commander, and ripped out his juggler with his teeth. And so the villagers saw him. This is a place where they believed in vampires, the way that others believe in ghosts and things like that. And, um, and they called him the vampire. They thought he had, he had drunk the blood of, of the commander. Um, he then started a campaign where he conquered basically coast to coast in this whole area. Um, and this man became the regional notable. The sultan finally agreed to let him keep his position and to keep the territories because he had no other option. So he said, send me one falcon a year, which is basically to give up the fight. Send me one falcon a year as a, as a token of your submission, but otherwise keep everything. Uh, and the other uh, uh, populations around him, the other towns, uh, made their peace with him because they didn't want to be killed anymore. Uh, and he became uh, part of a, a lineage of local notables. Uh, I can tell you about towns like further up in this area, which ceased to exist as they were attacked by one or another group of notables, by another Ottoman force, by another Albanian force, another Greek force. Towns like Moskopolis, which were thriving commercial centers, which were raised to the ground the entire population sent into slavery. Um, it was a violent place. But I repeat, it was not because these were nations fighting against nations. It's because the empire was crumbling and would be, continue to crumble into the early 20th century. Um, and again, I'm repeating this over and over again. It is not a national struggle. It is not even on the axis of religion. Christians are killing Christians. Christians are killing Muslims. Muslims are killing Christians. Jews caught in between. Um, uh, it's, it, it was a violent place, generally speaking. So again, before we start getting all sentimental about empires, these were not happy places. Right? Quite the contrary. Um, but that doesn't mean that therefore, because they are unhappy with the empire, that immediately they start thinking about nations. It's too soon for that. Nations are, are, are recent things. You might begin with 1789 in France, but for the most part, we're dealing with the 19th and 20th centuries, the age of nations. Um, nations was not the first thing to come when you're thinking, how do I solve my problems? Uh, what they did think about was changing empires. So what you do begin to see is conspiracies in various places where they begin to look to foreign powers, thinking we can transfer our allegiance from the sultan to someone else, a king, an emperor, an empress, as the case may be, uh, and maybe that would be more stable. But for the most part of the 18th century, you don't have these options. There is no nearby power to threaten you. Until, until 1797. 1797. So 1797 is one of the many years of the French and Napoleonic Wars and vitally important to this region. In that year, um, a man whom the Greeks called um, the, man, the, the, the Frenchman from the good place, which is to translate Bonaparte of the French, right? um, the man from the good place, Bonaparte, um, uh, led an army which conquered Venice up here. Um, and in conquering Venice, took over some of the last Venetian overseas territories, which is this group of islands called the Ionian Islands, 1797. And suddenly, the French Revolution happens right on the Balkan coasts, and these become departments, departements of the French Republic. And suddenly, you have uh, a different model state, which offers sovereignty, which it did, and citizenship to all of the male population, women too, but not, in, not fully so, promises future elections based on the French constitution, creates something of a local upheaval, but what they're offering most, first and foremost is good liberal principles of the day, good liberal principles. And those principles are protection of person, protection of property, taking the status quo and freezing it into a system of what we would call economic inequality, uh, but at least there would be equality before the law, meaning what you have will be protected and you will not be arbitrarily killed. Uh, at least not regularly and not often the way it happened across the bay. Well, the French are then kicked out by the Russians, and this becomes a Russian protectorate. The Russians arrive with another model of a modern state, aristocratic or autocratic, 
Uh, but they arrive also and, and promise stability, which they actually do provide. Um, we're going to have an aristocracy restored here. We're going to have uh, uh, a gentry. But we're going to have, most of all, law and order, the rule of law, and protection of private property. All right. Again, freezing inequality into place. Uh, the Russians leave. The French come back now as an empire, promise the same thing. And then finally, the British attack them and throw them out by the year 1814 and take all of these islands here, and these become British territory until 1864. Right? Because they become basically a British dominion, long after there's an independent Greece, in other words. So what do they all have in common? What do they all have in common? First and foremost, what they're offering is what the Ottomans had not yet learned, and in fact wouldn't learn, uh, which is to say a modern centralized state. They recruit heavily from the Ottoman mainland over here, mercenaries by the tens of thousands, irregulars basically, dress in kilts, and bring them into their forces, train them in modern warfare. They pay them well. They pay them on time. If they lose a battle, they're not executed. If, um, um, if they fall afoul of a local notable, again, they're not executed or not looted, uh, meaning it's a different understanding of what a state can actually do. Uh, and what they see most of all from the Ottoman mainland and begin to look at it as a model and begin to make overtures already in the early 1800s, what they see is security, you know, something that they themselves lacked. There are conspiracies. There are conspiracies, which again, in the, in the nationalist narratives, have been construed as preludes to the national movements, as preludes to the national movements. But they were not that at all. In fact, what you have is Muslim notables with Christian notables hiring mercenaries, Christian mercenaries, and asking, in this case, France uh, to take over, uh, to become the new ruler of the region, and to provide for this region what they've already provided for the Ionian Islands and what they provided for France itself, stability, hierarchy, predictability, regularity, uh, and, and protection of person and property. And what's interesting about these conspiracies is that it wasn't Christians saying to other Christians, come save us from Muslims. Not at all. Nothing like that. It was Muslims and Christians asking for the protection of a foreign power, uh, meaning things were so bad that both Christians and Muslims uh, were looking for alternatives. Um, so if this was the case, the conspiracies I'm talking to you about are from the year 1810 or so. By 1821, it's changed. It's become a national revolution. The revolution that breaks out in 1821, a mere six years later, is a national revolution. And how did this come to pass? Right? What makes what seems to be a, a, a relatively speaking, multi-confessional, multi-religious territory uh, into a land of national wars, of people against people? I mean, how was this complexity simplified into two opposing sides, which are now called nations for the first time? Um, and the answer has a lot to do with um, Europe in the year 1815. Europe in the year 1815. As most people know, Europe in the year 1815 is the end of the Napoleonic Wars. The Congress of Vienna, where the monarchs of Europe and only of Europe decide the fate of Europe itself, but also parts of the, other parts of the world, including Latin America. Um, uh, and the Congress of Vienna was accompanied by something else, which was called the Holy Alliance, the Holy Alliance, in which three monarchs, then joined by almost all the other monarchs of Europe and all the other governments of Europe, agree that henceforth, after the French Revolution, after the usurpations of Napoleon, we're looking for a recapturing of something that never existed, but a recapturing of this deeply Christian and hierarchical Europe. Europe, in other words, which is the Europe of Christians, of, Christ of divine right, uh, of, uh, in which the monarch is, is the vessel for God to speak. Uh, a reaction, pure and simple, um, inventing something which had never existed before, a tradition which had never pre really, really existed. And what's interesting about the Congress of Vienna and the Holy Alliance is that even though, geographically speaking, the Ottoman Empire includes Europe, the Ottoman Empire is not invited. Um, it was a Christian affair. It was only a Christian affair. Um, the sultan was not invited to send his representatives. The sultan, in the end, said, I never have a part to do with this Europe because I'm not one of you. I'm a Muslim. Um, um, and so this new Europe was being redefined in a way that hadn't really been defined before as something which is clearly demarcated as Christian, meaning it's not simply anymore 
um, uh, a geographic designation, nor simply a designation of the religion of the monarch, but of the population itself, of the population itself. Uh, and around the same time, um, Greeks who had been traveling everywhere worldwide, but especially in the Mediterranean as merchants, begin to get this new self-assurance of themselves as uh, Christians first and foremost. Now you could say they always knew they were Christian, but now they're settling in places like Odessa in Russia, where they're becoming extremely wealthy merchants. Uh, Greek merchants control about 90% of the trade in the Black Sea, which is a lot of trade. Uh, about 90% of the Russian grain exports, which is the main Russian export. They become extremely affluent, and they're protected by a Tsar who is himself Orthodox, the only monarch who's actually Orthodox. And they're privileged, right? and they feel uh, a certain sense of pride, and they're being told over and over again that, you know, that they're part of an ancient lineage. They're the birth both of civilization, right? both of civilization and of Christianity itself, you know, organized Christianity. Um, they are the ones who did it, and they begin to publish books and open in printing houses and to use their merchant networks to spread the word all over the Mediterranean to other Greek communities using this new printed language, uh, uh, consolidating the sense of who they are, entitled, privileged, unique. You know, you know, every nation thinks they're unique, but these ones also have money to go with it and trade networks to go with it. Um, they set up colonies all around Italy, as far as London, where the grain is exported to, uh, of course in Russia itself. And in the year 1814, just as the Napoleonic Wars are coming to an end, a society of low-level, uh, but relatively speaking, affluent Greek merchants set up this thing called the Friendly Society, a conspiracy. And they put forward this plan that the Greeks have to be liberated by re-establishing something like the Byzantine Empire. Now, by Greeks, what they meant exactly isn't entirely clear. It become clear later. They certainly meant the Orthodox. Greek speakers, well, not all Orthodox are Greek speakers. In fact, most of them weren't. Um, but there would be a reestablishment, they said, of some sort of Greek entity and try to overthrow the Sultan to create some sort of Greece. And the word begins to spread. The word begins to spread until finally the word is spread, especially to merchants, notables, and mercenaries in this region, in the Peloponnese, who until that time had been working in the Ottoman system. So the question is, so um, uh, uh, why this sudden change? These are the very same people who had been working with Muslims against the Sultan. The very same people who, in a month before the revolution, are still collecting taxes for the Sultan and for the Pasha and, sp and splitting the, uh, the proceeds um, uh, with their Muslim, with their Muslim uh, um, uh, counterparts. And so why the sudden change? Part of it has to do with this new Europe which privileged Christianity and gave them the notion uh, for the first time that <clears throat> this territory with some sort of understanding of ancient and uh, medieval history, that this territory not only had been Greece, but it should be Greece and only for the Greeks and only for the Greeks. And this was a very sudden transformation. And so what happens is, the, is 1821, 1821. Um, it's complicated what happens. It wasn't entirely clear where Greece is uh, because there had never been a place called Greece. There had been city-states in ancient times. There had been Byzantium, but there had never been a place called Greece, so it wasn't clear where to put it. Uh, I was speaking over dinner with one of our colleagues who pointed out, rightly, that the first uprising of the Greek Revolution took place in Romania, <laughs> or Moldova, uh, it failed miserably because the, 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 the peasantries there thought that the Greeks were the Ottoman exploiters. They're the tax collectors there. So, you know, the, the last thing they do is join. Well, this was a miserable failure, but it then takes off here in this region. I won't go into a lot of the detail about how and why, uh, but suffice it to say that through a combination of the conspiracy, misunderstandings of the situation locally and worldwide, a belief that there was another wave of terror coming down on them, uh, perpetrated by the Pasha and his allies, that all of these conspired to get the local notables to mobilize the peasantry, led by the mercenaries, to begin to attack not Ottoman authorities, but all Muslims du court. All Muslims du court. Meaning Muslims at this point had become understood in their minds as a representation of the Ottoman regime. You can't change the regime unless you get rid of anyone who is associated with it. And this meant Islam. Um, it begins in spring 1821, punctuated by um, some 
uh, well-known and you could say heroic battles, uh, army against army, in which the local armies mobilized and defeated much larger Ottoman armies. Um, uh, it was punctuated also by less than honorable massacres, uh, the famous one being in the capital of the Morea, a town called Tripolitere, where about 15,000 men, women, and children were slaughtered uh, uh, after the fall of the town. Um, uh, and also by lots and lots of microscopic, small um, conflicts that takes place in all villages and all towns, so that by 1823, in this region, where there had been a population of um, one Muslim to six Christians, by the end of it, there's no Muslims at all. They're gone. They disappear. Um, and now for the first time, we begin to speak about something which is commonplace for someone who knows modern Greek history, that Greece is an unusually homogeneous place. And it is. But it was made that way. Any nation, as I said, is made. But it has to become that. Um, and this is where it began. Um, uh, uh, and here you begin to see the first pronouncement, the first constitutions would say that Greece is going to be a country in which the Orthodox Christians are the citizens. That's it. Um, uh, there are Catholics also, another minority. Uh, because of the French influence and the fears about what the French might do, they decide they're going to be citizens too, even though uh, the Orthodox were extremely suspicious of the Catholics. They called them Franks, meaning like crusaders and things like that. But they had to accept the Catholics. At least they accepted Christ, as they put it themselves. Uh, but whoever's left is going to be, uh, uh, is going to be Christian. Um, well, to begin with, uh, the Allied powers in the West were not happy about this. It was right around this time, if you were to look at Italy, Spain, and Portugal, there were a series of liberal revolutions taking place. Right around that time, uh, we're talking 1820, 1821. Um, now, these were in places where uh, revolutionaries demanded constitutions. Uh, they demanded um, that uh, citizens should be given to Christians. Um, now, if you say that you want to give citizenship to Christians in Spain, uh, then you're saying that everyone should be a citizen, because Spain is almost entirely Christian. Uh, same thing in Italy. Uh, Greece, the Balkans, is different. You know, there it has to become that. Well, the European powers were not happy about this, about revolutions. They thought this was an affront to the established authority, an affront to the divine right of the monarchs. So they sent in armies, Austrian armies marched into Italy, Austria being an empire which was against nationalism, obviously, marched into Italy and put down revolutions there. The French, uh, on a religious crusade, put together an army which they nicknamed the 10,000 Sons of Saint Louis and marched into Spain to put down atheist liberals there, as they understood them. And then the Greek Revolution breaks out. And the last thing they wanted was to have to put down another revolution. So they sat back, said nothing, did nothing. Even the Greeks who were in Russian service condemned it and said, this is way too early. You know, this population of Ottoman Greeks is not ready for, for self-government. Uh, they disavowed it. Everyone thought the Russians were behind it, but the only ones who knew the Russians were not behind it were the Russians. Um, and then waited for the Sultan to do his work, which is to say, put it down himself, because they were putting down other revolutions. Well, I told you there's this problem of mobilization in the Ottoman Empire. They couldn't find armies. Well, they didn't have an army. They had one who was defeated in one famous battle, Dervenakia, and that's it. They had no more armies. Uh, so this drags on. 1824, 1825, 1826. It's still going on. It still hasn't been put down. And at that point, the sultan, desperate for lack of an army, turns to Egypt, works out a deal. This is technically part of the Ottoman Empire, works out a deal. And so Mehmet Ali, who's the founder of modern Egypt by most counts, sends his son, who is one of the great commanders, uh, Ibrahim Pasha, sends an army to subdue the Greeks. And that probably would have been the end of the Greek Revolution. Uh, this was a modern, trained army. Uh, this was people who marched in formation. Uh, these are people with naval support. And they began systematically to recapture all of these territories. And as they're recapturing these territories, um, they reward their soldiers not only with pay, which was intermittent, but with the traditional right of the region, which is to take slaves, uh, which is the Greeks, when they were defeated the Ottomans, took many of their prisoners as slaves uh, in 1821. Uh, the Ottomans, other Ottoman armies always did this, and now the Egyptians are doing the same thing. And this gets into the European press, and this gets into the Philhellene and classicist communities. The Christian Greeks, 
the sons of Leonidas and of, uh, of Byzantium are being exterminated and taken as slaves. Um, and this certainly riles popular opinion in what's later called uh, Philhellenism, the friends of the Greeks, the, fr the friends of the, Hel of the Hellions. And popular opinion turns decidedly in favor of the Greeks. Uh, you would think that most of this would have been about classical references, but the more I look at it, it wasn't. It was Christian references, that it's Christian Europe has to save the Christians of the Ottoman Empire. It was a, it was a religious question, first and foremost. Very few references to classical times. It's about Christianity versus Islam. Um, public opinion is putting pressure, uh, but it was really uh, Russia which changed the power's opinion about this. But when Russia agrees that this is not a liberal revolution, this is a religious war, and convinces France and Britain to follow in that same lead. What they're all worried about is not simply religion, not simply about humanitarian issues, but that the stability of the entire region was being destabilized, it was being questioned by the, by the ongoing war. And this whole area had become uh, infested with piracy, coming from all over the Mediterranean. The British, a seafaring power, the French re-entering as a, as a naval power in the Mediterranean, and the Russians, who depend on these sea routes to export, were all alarmed that the Sultan could not put an end to it. And even when they could put an end to the violence on land, they couldn't get rid of the pirates on sea. One thing leads to another. They sent a fleet um, uh, to monitor and to put pressure on the Egyptians to stop being taking slaves, basically, and burning. Um, and uh, this leads to something which is probably an accident, which is called the Battle of Navarino in 1827. And the entire Ottoman Egyptian fleet is sunk. You can go see it today. It is still there in the Bay of Navarino, which is right here, right there. Today's Pilos. Um, and that was basically it. You know, we're sort of a victory uh, snatched from defeat. Um, something unexpected and extraneous to what was happen happening there. So the powers agreed uh, gradually that there would be an independent Greece, uh, that they would recognize Greece independence, not as a liberal movement, not as a humanitarian thing, but as a Christian people being rescued from an Ottoman power. And over the years, uh, they began, by 1830, they began to give it more and more recognition as a completely independent country. They gave it an absolute king to make sure that it was in line with the, uh, with the spirit of the times, which is a absolutism. He was a Catholic, and this would be a problem, but at least he was Christian from their point of view. Um, and sort of the tying up the loose ends of this entire process uh, happened when soon after that Battle of Navarino in 1828, uh, the powers agreed that in order to stabilize this new country of Greece, uh, they would have to pacify it uh, by making its population homogeneous. So um, the French went in. It's called the, the French Expedition of the Morea, Expedition du Morea, in this area here. Landed their fleet, landed their soldiers, um, stopped the fighting from taking place, took combatants, uh, stopped banditry, stopped them, and reimposed some sort of order. Uh, but part of their mission was to evacuate any Muslim they could find. Uh, Egyptian, people who had been born here, Moreans, uh, Ottomans from other part of the thing. And, and so they complete this process which has begun on the ground, which is to render the population homogeneous. Um, and this was to be the latest addition to Europe. Um, and it was. And it was. So, um, it's not pretty. It has its heroic moments. Uh, you could take this as a general critique of nations and of nationalism, but I hope you won't, because it's not exactly what I mean to say. Um, these empires, in this area in particular, had always been violent. Well, the violence is now being redirected toward a different goal. Uh, it's not that there had been peace then disrupted by, by violence. The violence was always there, but now it's in the name of something different, which is the nation. And the nation does have these totalizing aspects. Uh, it makes for total war. It makes for total confrontations. It makes for total battles, of which we see many during the Greek War of Independence. It makes for total destruction, of which we see on both sides during the Greek War of Independence. Um, but it also makes for something else, and it becomes the vessel for something which we would learned to appreciate in more recent times, which is it makes room for popular sovereignty. Uh, a nation is not the same thing as living in an empire. Being a member of a nation was a way also to demand things and to claim things. It so happened for complicated reasons, that the nation becomes the vessel for popular sovereignty. And I'll give you a brief overview of what follows. First of all, Greece was meant to be the exception, but it becomes the rule. 
so is that a series of nationalist revolutions taking place all the way up to Moldova and Romania um, overthrow the Ottoman Empire for good uh, using that same axis of religion, uh, meaning discerning who is on our side and who is against us based on religion, which might be uh, Christian versus Muslim, as it continues to be even in the 1990s, or it could be Catholic against um, uh, Orthodox, as it was during, again, the 1990s, Serb against, against Croatia. Uh, but that axis persists. And I put it to you also that it doesn't end in the Balkans. Uh, that same axis was then used by Republican Turkey when it, it, it overthrew the last of the Ottoman Empire, when Kemal Ataturk established the Turkish Republic, um, part of the precondition for which he thought was to remove most of the Christian population, which happens in 1922. And that completes the cycle. Um, but looking even more forward, um, we begin to see that uh, uh, the nation in this case uh, became a foundation for something which we'd probably find more likable. Uh, the king who was absolute uh, is overthrown. Uh, first, he was, uh, uh, there was a coup against him in 1844, and Greece became a constitutional monarchy, the first of the revolutions of the 1840s, followed in 1848 by a generalized one. Um, in that day, in that year, in 1844, every adult Greek male got the vote, which is unheard of in Europe. Every adult male got the vote. Uh, later on, there'd be a further, a further movements uh, until finally Greece became a republic. And I'd put it to you that the nation, violent as it was, uh, violence, a violence following on the violence of the empires themselves, uh, did allow for something more inclusive and it allowed for entitlements. Uh, as a citizen, one could demand more. One could insist on more. As a citizen, one could claim that they too have certain rights, be they legal or maybe even material. Um, uh, the nations, in other words, are like it or not, that vessel which gave us something which we did not have under the empires, uh, which was popular sovereignty. Um, how, how am I doing? I mean, I'm done, are you? Um, yeah. All right. All right, thank you. The floor is open for questions, and, and from Zoomlandia. Well, we're getting questions there, too. Yes, the back row. Thanks for a wonderful, wonderful lecture about something I know nothing about. And so I'm always grateful for those kinds of lectures. And I have two questions. And the first one is, I th might be tangential because it referred to this interesting story you told about Greek um, merchants up in the Black Sea and elsewhere in, in the region that became very wealthy. And I started to think, to what extent did the diaspora play in the strengthening and genesis of nationalism? So that's the first question. And then the second question is one that's probably an, an obvious one. You've probably gotten a lot before. Is how does your work dialogue with the famous imagined communities of Benedict Anderson and, and who gives all that, you know, uh, that uh, emphasis on the, the importance of print culture in the in in nationalism, which is not something that that you really discussed discussed at all. And so I'm interested to know if it, did that play a role at all mm -hmm. in in the dynamics that you're that you're talking yeah. about. No, those are actually both not, not at all. Do you mind if I take the question and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah? I mean, they're they're good. They should yeah. So they're. <laughs> No, it's not at all tangential. So the first question is actually central to what I've been writing just recently in my, in my recent chapters. It's actually the central point, which is to say that the sense of Greek. So as I said, if you're in the Ottoman Empire, uh, you called yourself a variety of things, but you never, you didn't use the term Greek, Greek, United. These terms didn't exist. They existed in these colonies outside, right? That's where you find the term. Because if you're in France, you're all Greek, right? If you're in Russia, you're all Greek. If you're in Britain, you're all Greek, Greek, you know, all of these things, right? And there the generalization holds. Um, and the ones who are the most fiercely uh, patriotic in the end, but at the very least um, propagating this idea and they begin to use this new term, Hellene, which was taken from ancient times, uh, meaning we are a coherent whole, we use the same language, the ones who really propagate this are the very wealthy merchants, especially of Odessa, who then use this money to, uh, to, to finance publications, textbooks, pamphlets, journals. And most of the subscribers to these journals are also abroad in these, in these other areas. 
And so both the readers and the producers, and you know how it is, you know, when somebody leaves their country, they become more that than they were when they left, right? And so it, it was that kind of thing. Um, so, so it was, I mean, that's very appropriate, and, and it really matters that what was financing all of this everywhere was Russian wheat, because they dominated the wheat, the, the wheat trade, right? Now, the Russians were horrified what came of this. Right? They never wanted a revolution whatsoever. They had no idea what was happening right? until it already happened. But it was Russian wheat financing it, under Russian protection, flying the Russian flag, right? Uh, Greeks, right? Now, as for print culture, which is segs from what, what we were just talking about, that's also, I think, an appropriate question. So, Benedict Danderson, for those of you who don't know, part of the argument that he makes is what allows us to think of ourselves abstractly as part of the same community, because we're never going to meet most of the, our compatriots, what allows us to believe that we're part of the same thing is we're reading the same things. And this has to do with print culture and print capitalism, where more and more people become literate and can more cheaply buy published books and printed books. <clears throat> so someone in you know, San Francisco will believe that they're having a conversation with someone in New York, right, for, for example. But it happens everywhere. And this is the foundation for national thinking, because you're also using the idiom of a shared nation. Right? And that is what the nation is, a shared language. So Benjamin Danderson, you know, of course, you know, I have lots of time for him. He, what he's good at explaining is good at explaining is the preconditions. Um, when it comes to explaining events, you have to write history. Right? Benjamin Danderson, as you know, wasn't a historian, right? Um, which is good for him, right? But um, uh, but what we have to try to figure out is sequences, causalities, and things like that. And for there, you know, the idea of this print culture, this, this blossoming of Greek language literature, late 18th, early 19th century. Um, does matter. But what you do with it and what it produces is something of historical narration. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I also know next to nothing about the geographical region that you talked about. Um, but my question is, is not so much about Greece necessarily. I'm more interested in, in the role of religion that you outlined in your presentation. And you had kind of addressed two perspectives, one internal, one external. The European powers used the idea of a Christian Greek nation to legitimize their intervention. You also pointed out that, at least for the Russians, there was this economic interest in securing trade routes. And there's this aspect of political stability in a very important region. So here the question is how important was really religion, how really important was religion internal perspective. You mentioned the Greek merchants mm -hmm. that were very much interested in promoting trade and used the idea of a nation that came in they came in contact with to promote their own interests. Again here the question is how important was religion? And maybe one way to look into this more deeply would be to look at the role of religious actors or institutions, namely um, um, the, the, the Orthodox Church. When do they come into this game, and what role do they play? Okay, good. Should I uh, take it? Or? Yeah, yeah, why not? It. Eh? Another good question. Yes. Eh? Right. So, uh, right. So, so the, the part I should clarify, I think, is first that if you were an, uh, an Orthodox Christian in the Ottoman Empire, you were raised as that, right? It had increasing coherence, especially getting into the 19th century. You know about the Millet system, right? Where there's some sense of a community which is a religious community, which interacts with the sultan and with the central government in order to carry out its rule, right? So there's no question that someone in the Peloponnese knew that they were Christians, right? Romans, in other words. Um, the same thing was true of the Bulgarians, of the Serbs, who actually incidentally belonged to the same community of the Orthodox. Uh, what to do with them at the time of the Greek Revolution was never entirely clear. Um, uh, would they become Greek or, or not, right? Anyway, so that there's a consciousness, there was. Um, and it matters because some of your privileges and some of the things you can and cannot do have to do with religion. Uh, you had slightly more privileges, especially political ones, if you're a Muslim, and you can move up to the top of the hierarchy. Uh, if you were a Greek, then you could do very well in trade, and uh, local government, and in the management of the diplomacy of the empire. Uh, the Ottoman Empire's diplomats were Greeks, right, in front of us, right, all of them, um, uh, the so-called dragomans. Um, so religion matters as a marker, as a marker, and an important one. Uh, what changes is when the Europeans come and they speak about exclusive religions or monopolies of religions, because these are not polytheistic, uh, 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 multi-confessional uh, uh, empires. They're Christian empires. Plain and simple, to varying degrees. 
uh, meaning the supremacy of Christianity over other religions, or exclusively Christian populations. Um, and there's this understanding that you see among those powers, um, but as well increasingly among the Christians of the Ottoman Empire, that that's actually the key to stability, you know, homogeneity. And of course, if you're a Christian and you say, think now about a state which is only Christians, you don't have to share your tax revenue with your Muslim brethren. You don't have to uh, be accountable to Constantinople. You don't have to be accountable to a Pasha. You know, that's kind of attractive, right? And not only that, if something goes wrong, they're not going to cut off my head, right? Um, well, this in turn requires certain immunities and certain rights, and that means, for example, rule of law, liberal principles, and those do come later on. Um, uh, have I answered your question? Aspect about the church organization and the All right. Church. Well, the church, so the church, it's, it's a diffuse church. There, there's more than one patriarch. There's Jerusalem, there's Antioch, there's another, but the big one is Constantinople, right? And then they have bishops. Well, the patriarch is appointed by the sultan. It used to be a direct appointment of the bishops and archbishops as well, uh, all the way down the hierarchy, but increasingly this is delegated also to the, to the church. So the sultan has been using the Greek Orthodox, well, the, the Eastern Orthodox Church, as a mechanism in government in giving more and more privileges to the church to act on the sultan's behalf. Tax collection, uh, keeping the flock in order and submissive, um, uh, using excommunication, which is a real threat for some people, uh, anathematizing, um, law and order in some cases. Um, so they're getting more and more privileges, and the last thing they're thinking about is a revolution. There are a few texts uh, of priests who, and bishops who went over to the Russians and began to write anti-sultanic texts, but the vast majority of them are telling their flock not to rebel and to submit. And whenever there's a rebellion here, there's a rebellion there, there's an uprising there, the first thing that happens is the patriarch excommunicates all of them, right, the Christians. Um, come 1821, the patriarch was as surprised as anybody else, Gregory V. He's as surprised as anyone else. He's, going, he's pulling his hair out. He said, you know, this is not only bad because people will die, I'm going to lose my job or my head, you know, sort of like this is, you know, this is dangerous what you're doing. So he excommunicates all the revolutionaries, beginning with Ypsilanti, who was the man, and continuing with all the leadership of the Greek revolution, he excommunicates them. The sultan comes to him and he says, you know, listen, you know, this is not looking good. You're supposed to be keeping them in order and we have a revolution in our hands, not just a rebellion, but something called a nation. We don't even know what this is, right? So, so he starts handing in the names of all the people who may have been complicit. They get arrested and executed. And finally, the sultan gets so pissed off with him and so fed up, he holds him responsible and executes him. Right? <laughs> and that's when he becomes a national martyr, <laughs> if you know what I mean, right? Um, so you, his statue is in, in prominent places, and one of the best ones is that his statue is next to a statue of an actual revolutionary, right? But he'd excommunicated him. <laughs> so, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> As a uh, citizen of Berlin, let me thank you for having come across the Atlantic to educate us on European history. Um, when I think back to my history lessons uh, in the south of Germany, there was one important element that we were taught as, uh, as uh, students, and that was that the king that you mentioned, who was uh, installed by the powers of the time, was a German, <laughs> if I remember correctly, his name was Otto, mm -hmm. and he was a prince of Bavaria, not even of age, when he, when he became king of Greece. Why did they pick a German, a Catholic, not a Russian Orthodox, not a British prince, not a French prince? Why Otto? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so um, before I get to that, do you remember the Carlsbad Decrees? the Carlsbad Decrees. Mm -hmm. uh, um, they were written by another famous Greek, <laughs> which banned all their German student societies and all that. You can thank the Greeks. Anyway, so, um, um, so once it was decided gradually that there would be this independent state, it wasn't clear immediately what status it would have, autonomous, independent. Um, but when they finally decided it would be independent, part of the reasoning was that they'd actually appointed a governor. Uh, and that governor was the former Russian foreign minister. Uh, Kapodistria, uh, or Kapodistria in Greek, uh, who was Greek Orthodox but an Italian speaker from the, Greek, from the Ionian aristocracy, 
And, um, and he was something of a compromise with the suspicion because he had been the Russian foreign minister. Well, then some Greek notables uh, murdered him um, in, in the Peloponnese. And that's when the powers decided this is, that's it, there's going to be a king, but one we can rely on. So who? There's no Greek royal family. There's some princely families, but they tend to be the ones who are working with the sultan. All right. Um, well, if any of the main powers, France, Britain, and Russia, were to give one of their um, princes or princesses, then it would seem like bias toward that power. So uh, Leopold of Bavaria, the king, was, was a huge um, philhellene. You know from Munich, you see all these neo, uh, neoclassical buildings and the statues and all that. He was, he was a fanatic for, for things Greek. Um, and he wanted his son to become, they asked him and he said no. Um, uh, but the, he wanted his son to become, so he was a compromise candidate, so he wasn't too closely associated with anybody, right? Um, and as for him being Catholic, uh, well, there, you know, the, the Russians had said that once you become king of Greece, you have to convert um, and become Greek Orthodox. Uh, but he refused um, after the fact. And uh, this became an, it was an issue all the way to the end of his reign in the 1860s when he was overthrown, that he continued to be a Frank or a Catholic. Um, uh, France was happy, you know, religious France at that time, Restoration France at that time. This was fine. Um, uh, Britain was, you know, it's not, it's not a competing power, so that's fine too. Um, and anyway, they felt that the Greeks, unruly, devastated after the war, uh, having problems governing themselves, particularly after the the, the, the murder of the Greek governor, uh, needed an outside force who comes from one of the established royal families, and this was to perpetuate this idea that they're recognizing Greek independence not because it's a revolution, but a restoration of uh, independence. Right, if, if you see what I mean. I'm going to take one question from the, the online virtual world. I know you like dealing with nationalist history, so this is interesting. Um, it begins by saying it was a fascinating talk, and um, but there's one lingering downside, and as the EU was being formed, there was a strong drive to include Greece, which had just experienced a brutal middle military dictatorship as, in scare quotes, the cradle of democracy. The rest of the West was, was, has tolerated much bad, aggressive, and dangerous behavior by the current inhabitants of Greece, based on the notion that they have given us our democracy. Look at the situation in Cyprus, for example. I don't understand the question. Um, um, I'm not sure what to say. I mean, so the um, well, the, the EU was formed uh, with the EEC, and the Coal Commission was was formed without thinking of Greece way back when. Um, the dictatorship came much later, twenty years later, um, and then it ended. And then Greece was brought into the EU as a way to make sure that it became stable, democratic, and and liberal. Um, and and I think that that policy succeeded. It was, it was a very good thing. Um, the argument used at that time, this is the 1970s going up to 1980, uh, the argument used at that time was that you have to let Greece in because it is the, the cradle of European civilization. That, that argument was used then. But the rest I'm not following, and I'm not sure what to make of Cyprus either. Um, Christian Muslim. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, there's a problem. Um, um, so there's a different set of complexities. I mean, do we want to talk about Cyprus now? Um, um, Yes, no? Um, no? no. <laughs> yeah, okay. There were some other questions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for this very enlightening talk. Um, thank you for... Um, um, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, 1827, the religious factor, uh, I just want to add is that um, um, it could also look different. Uh, if you look um, to the Crimean War, um, when uh, France, Britain, Italy went side by side into a horrendous war against Russia uh, in 1853 to 56. Uh, so they were fighting uh, together with Muslims against Christians uh, mm -hmm. in, Crea in, in Crimea and in other front. And at that time also occupied uh, Piraeus in Athens because they were uh, fearing that the Greek would somehow uh, um, uh, get involved into this in the, into this fighting. That's right. And, and in the peace um, uh, settlement in Paris in 1856, there were just bad words on Greece if they should be remain occupied uh, mm -hmm. for a longer period of time. Just adding to this, religion um, as a factor that can be of use in international politics. 
um, and and but also could be um, a not so relevant factor. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if you would agree to this. Uh, no, I do. Of course, I do. Of course, I do. So there's a difference between saying that the causes belly was religion, Christian versus Muslim. That's one possibility, and vice versa. Uh, but the other one is to to remember that, however it's put, there's a religious axis there. So in the Crimean War, if you remember, the, the, the origins of the Crimean War was who has the right to protect the Christians of the Ottoman Empire, in which France and Russia competed against each other over that issue. So again, there the religious issue is there, and actually that's the, re, that's the cause of the war, right? Uh, 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 Louis, Louis Napoleon is uh, saying that, you know, no, France has the right to protect the Christians, Russia claiming, going back 100 years, its right to protect the Christians, so they go to war over the right to protect the Christians, and that's, you couldn't get more religious than that, right? Uh, but the second question we're asking is about um, the place of Greece in the Crimean War. And that's, um, that's complicated because the, um, there's a very strong pro-Russian party in Greece. And those who believed, including the king, by the way, that, the, um, that Greece should be siding with Russia against France and Britain and Sardinia. Right? Um, uh, for a variety of reasons. Part of it had to do with the trade routes and all that, but also has to do with religion and to who's the better protecting power. And the, uh, the French and the British sent in their gunboats to prevent Greece from siding with Russia. Um, uh, and you, one could well say that from that moment on, Greece would always be in the orbit of Britain and France. Right? Um, and that was the end of the Russian period of, of Greek history. Professor Rose. Thank you, Yanni. I, I learned a tremendous amount, and I appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. I, I have a question of what changed between, and I'm going to get the timeline off, between 1821, 22, when the expectation of the European powers was that the Sultan would put down this Greek revolution, mm -hmm. and then 1826, 27, when the <clears throat> Sultan goes to put down this Greek revolution, this huge reaction from mm -hmm. the rest of Europe. Yeah. What is going on with respect to European public opinion, the views of the monarch? that lead them to take a very different approach than they might have taken four or five years earlier. Yeah. So I, I can't, I don't know which is the most important yet. I still have to figure it out in my own head. But I can tell you what a series of possibilities are, the real ones. And so, so the one was that there was this groundswell of opinion in favor of the Greek revolutionaries against the Ottomans and Egyptians. Um, now, what's interesting about that new groundswell is that it united all political opinion in Europe, uh, Germany, France, Britain, whereas before they'd been divided. Because when it first broke out, the conservatives were saying, it's another revolution, we're not going to support another revolution. Whereas the liberals were saying, ah, let's support the Greeks, and therefore we'll support liberalism in our own country. Um, and then the Tories would say no, and the ultras in France would turn it down, and the liberals in France would say yes. But when it became, well, so the, um, there was rumors circulating at the same time that Ibrahim Pasha was not simply conquering the territory, but he planned to remove all the Christians and put in Fela, Fela, the uh, uh, Egyptian peasants. It was not true. But it was true that um, his soldiers were harvesting slaves, right, for sure, and burning, and pillaging, and murdering, and this, this, this was happening. It was, it was that kind of warfare. Um, and very effectively, because there was a well-trained army, right? Um, so at that point, there's no longer division in public opinion. Russia also, you know, by then was vehemently, public opinion was vehemently in favor of the Greeks. The monarchs hesitated, partly because they were still stuck on this question of legitimacy. Um, 1815 had been the establishment of legitimate monarchies and legitimate regimes, including tacitly the Ottoman one. Um, and as you know, they, they renounced, they denounced, uh, renounced the Greek revolutionaries in 1821. Um, they're probably influenced by public opinion. Russia was influenced by another matter, which was not so much that part of the Balkan Peninsula, but uh, an ongoing conflict with Turkey over the Black Sea region. And they wanted to go to war anyway and would use that as a causes belly, as an excuse to, to go to war. Um, um, uh, and I think what really pushed all of them is that all three of them had trade interests in the area. So if you're in the Black Sea, to get out into your markets, you have to go through the Aegean Sea, which is that region which by then become a nest of piracy and, and warfare and corsairs, uh, working for whoever or, or for themselves. Um, and this applied to all three powers. So the British, who want their wheat, because right? they don't produce enough wheat. Um, the, um, they get it. It's complicated, but they get it. Right? 
Uh, France, which also needs wheat, it goes through periodic deficits. France, which is also trying to become the new Mediterranean power, and would do that at the expense of the Ottomans and the Egyptians, right? even though they're supplying the Egyptians, but anyway. Um, uh, uh, and, and the Russians, whose main export is wheat from the Black Sea, which can no longer go to market. Right? I think that if there's one thing that finally pushes the monarchies, it's that one. Right? But in the world of diplomacy, you can't say we're going to war over trade. Right? Now you could, but then they couldn't. Right? Uh, this is the Vienna system. This is the Holy Alliance. Uh, you have to have an argument which allows this revolution when you turned all the other, we said all the other. So what you do is you say, it's not a revolution. It's a war for independence to reclaim an ancient lost independence. And it's rescuing Christians from Muslims, which by then it was actually. Right? To, to build on uh, that question, there's another one from the, the Zoom world. Please comment on the Russian involvement with their concept of Russia as third Rome and the Greek Black Sea communities, which date back to the earliest periods of Greek civilization. Yeah, so the, um, so the Third Rome, is, that's more about the 18th century. So Catherine the Great, the empress, had um, a series of projections about these things she called plans and projects. One of them was for the Caucasus, another one was for the Balkans, and the Balkan one was supposed to be some sort of, or Russia being Orthodox was claiming to be the Third Rome. There was Rome, there was Byzantium, and others would be Russia. So she would, be, she, she would be the empress of the third Rome, or she raised one of her sons to speak modern Greek, and he would become the ruler of this new territory. It was one of many possibilities. Um, but what Catherine did, and this was spoken about, didn't go anywhere, partly because they weren't willing to dismantle the Ottoman Empire yet, and the other powers wouldn't let them. Uh, what she did that was more consequential is that when she conquered the Black Sea region, uh, basically from... Uh, we're talking about from what is today Romania all the way over to the Caucasus, that whole north coast, uh, it didn't have enough populations and it started bringing in settlers, and including log tens of thousands of Greek settlers uh, from, the from the Ottoman Balkans, and then brought in merchants to carry the goods. That part was unplanned, but it became this boom, where suddenly the, this, this endless uh, step was put under wheat cultivation using a, a variety of wheat that came from the Balkans, um, and then the Greek merchants exported it. Um, uh, so there was a Greek presence from before, from ancient times, but the people we're talking about are merchants who had recently arrived, mainly from the Ottoman Empire and from the Ionian Islands. Um, and they're the backbone of, of the Greek nationalist movement. Um, and if you look at the figures about who is joining the different movements and all that, always the majority is merchants, and usually in Russia. Right. Thanks, Yanni. Um, so I really love the phrase that you used a couple of times in your presentation, uh, that uh, nations must be made. And I got this sense from your presentation, correct me if this is wrong, because it's the premise of the kind of two-part question that I have, that this is kind of a forgotten history, that this history of the making of the Greek nation as a homogenous nation is not something that's taught and remembered and part of the imagined community of Greece. Um, so that strikes me as very interesting and controversial to make create the origins around, um, or I'm imagining potentially controversial, to make the origins around the killing and expulsion of, of Muslims from, from that territory. Um, so I'm kind of curious, this goes a bit beyond perhaps the parameters of the project per se, but if you have thoughts about why this is then a new history, like why would something that seems, from your telling at least, relatively like clearly established in history, like what forces, other than obvious ones that we can imagine, but like why would it be so easily lost? Is it because there's not a coherent people that was expelled that would continue to kind of make claims uh, to the place that they left? And then in the present, like, well, this, I, I, I can't help but think of the United States. It's so controversial to talk about the founding of the United States and the misdeeds of the United States. And that's very threatening for a sense of identity for, for many, many committed to the founders of the United States. So is this less threatening, though, for Greek identity, do you think, than something? No, I think it's very comparable. Okay. Uh, and I'm glad you raised the American case because that's exactly what I have in mind, among others. Um, uh, and it's still very controversial in the United States. I mean, you, you go to some states right now and some, you know, education boards, you take your life in your own hands if you talk about these things, right? 
Um, uh, and so this is true everywhere. Uh, and so um, there was a period starting in the mid 19th century when the uh, sort of the, the national narrative was established, um, which had to do with some amalgam of ancient Greece, or the ancient Greek city states, with Byzantium. And then the sense that the period that followed the fall of Byzantium, meaning about give or take 300 years, was a foreign occupation. Right? Um, and, um, and so this became taught, and it's still taught to a large extent, you know, with varying degrees of accuracy. But generally what it does is it takes complexities, which I think are fascinating. I mean, I, I come from Greece. And when I think of the complexities, uh, that's what makes me excited about Greek history. You know, all these traces all around me of all these different civilizations and that, like that, the language groups and all that, this, this is interesting. Uh, but like all national histories, it gets flattened, right? Um, uh, you know, so the United States is, you know, what? Jews, the pilgrims, the pilgrims. And, you know, so, you know, and there it's all clear, right? And there's some problems in between, but it's basically it looks good and hunky-dory, right? And all that. Well, this is true, like every country, including Greece, right? I mean, go talk to the Italians about Italian history. Um, go talk to the French, uh, who were just talking about Napoleon recently and the anniversary of his death. 1821 is that anniversary, too. Um, uh, so it's extremely controversial because, you know, you know histories are written. Um, um, it, see, if you look at only at Europe, you'd say, well, because histories are written as part of the state project, or because, you know, universities and states are very well connected in Europe. But then what about the United States? Well, the same thing has happened, but at a level of civil society, right? Um, so the, the state explanation doesn't quite work, right? Because it doesn't explain something like Canada or, uh, or Australia or uh, the United States. But yeah, these things are, you know, it's controversial and it's not always pleasant. And the, the worst part about Greek history is you, know, you try to give complexity, and before you know it, you're dealing with nationalism coming from Turkey, from, you know, Egypt, you know, from like that, and you say, guys, you know, like, can we just sit, calm down a bit and have a serious conversation? You know, we're all intelligent, you know. But you face this all the time. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I would uh, like to um, come back to Russia. <laughs> take the chance uh, to ask you as a historian of Russia. Um, I mean, you have, you have stressed now um, a lot of times the, uh, the important role that Russia played in this process of Greek merchants in Odessa and so on. Um, and I would be now interested, uh, uh, when does, um, when it comes to Russia and politics towards the Balkans, when does the Slavic element come in? So if you would put, in, mm. put uh, Greece uh, in the context of the other uh, Orthodox Christians, Serbs and Bulgarians who've mentioned them, I mean, at the beginning it was an open concept. So if you, if you identify as a Greek, you are Orthodox. If you identify as a Greek, you could be a Greek. Mm -hmm. But most of them... Uh, uh, yeah, didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, didn't identify uh, as as Greeks, and and then we have Russia with this pan-Slavic element, uh, you know, fostering Bulgaria and so on. So, how do you on with uh, Russia orthodoxy on the one side, but also a Slavic power? Yeah, no, Balkans? that's. Um, I, I mean, you're looking way ahead, and, and rightly so. The implications of all this. So, if you're looking, let's say, your the year 1800, and you're looking at the world geopolitically, and you see how do you organize and look at the world. So when um, uh, it's still confession, it's still religion. Um, it will transmorgify into nation, but at the time it's religion. So, for instance, when the Russians said Greki, often what they meant was the Orthodox of the Balkans, right? Which included Bulgarians and Serbians and Romanians and, and all those people, right? Um, uh, and there was some confusion because also because the trade, what, what the Russians always saw was merchants going back to places like Nizhinsk and going back to um, uh, Mariupol and places like that. Um, so the Greeks they saw were the merchants. And the merchants, no matter what they were, spoke Greek. That was the language of trade of the region and in, in the end of the Mediterranean. Um, so Grek to them was the person who spoke Greek and was Orthodox, but at home he had spoken Vlach, Albanian. Um, there's these whole groups, and you can see the Russians begin to change their opinions. They say, well, these are Arnauti. Arnauti means Albanians, right? Um, and then they call the same people Greki, right? So they're, they're trying to figure it out themselves. It's confusing. So the solidarities that they're talking about in that period, that, that up until the 1820s and 1830s, the solidarities they're talking about, which are partly emotional and not decisive, but they're there, 
are that we as an orthodox country are the only ones who can protect the orthodox. There's no other power to protect the orthodox. Um, um, and so they applied it as a blanket across the, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and that included all these other language groups. Um, but they saw them as a religion. Where it really begins to change is um, the 1870s. I mean, decisively. Because at that point, the main Orthodox country, the only real independent Orthodox country at that time, is Greece, uh, which is not Slavic, and has gone over to the British and the French, categorically, de definitively. And the religious argument isn't working anymore. So when Russia, Russia regularly, as a tradition, goes to war with the Ottoman Empire since the 18th century, so in this particular war in the 1870s, um, they went to war uh, more as pan-Slavs, and they begin to pick up the ethnic question. So yes, they're Orthodox, but they're Slavs like us, right? Um, and this begins to change. Now this means, therefore, that the connection to Greece will always be weaker. Um, uh, and by the same token, the connection to Orthodox Albanians will be weaker. Or the connection to Romanians will be weaker. But it can make a stronger case for Bulgarians, Serbians, uh, well, especially those groups. Um, so I would say the change comes around the 1870s, it seems to me. Okay, I think um, we have COVID regulations here at the American Academy, and I'm sure this discussion could go on all evening. And I'd like to thank Professor Katsanis for an absolutely wonderful lecture, and we look forward to reading the book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.